everybody, happy Monday. Today we're going to talk about catastrophizing and how to stop it. But before we jump into that, huge thank you to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this portion of the video. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our community, the first 30 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash Katie and use the promo code Katie, all one word, lowercase, no quotes, during the sign up process. I have been using it for the past few weeks and I watched a documentary about why we sleep and another one on how to be more creative. It's really helpful and informative and I cannot wait to watch more. Okay, now let's get into today's topic. To catastrophize is to imagine the worst possible outcome of an action or event. And let's be honest, it's something that we have all done. We have something happen to us or to those around us and we automatically think the worst. It can start out as a small worry and slowly but surely we have considered every possible way something could go wrong or have already decided that everything is going to go wrong. It can change our mood, affect our ability to think clearly, and even hurt our relationships. Many psychologists and other researchers believe that catastrophizing is born out of anxiety. Anxiety is diagnosed when we have a lot of worry, and no matter what we do, we aren't able to control it. And that's part of the diagnostic criteria for generalized anxiety disorder, so if you want more information about that or other anxiety disorders, I will link my anxiety playlist in the description. Researchers also label catastrophizing as a cognitive distortion, which is when our mind convinces us of something that actually isn't true. Common cognitive distortions are things like black and white thinking, filtering, and overgeneralization, just to name a few. Now you may be wondering, okay, Katie, I know what catastrophizing is, but how do I stop doing it? No, 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 no. Why would we want to stop doing this? We can't just pretend nothing's going on and that things are okay. If we don't consider how bad things could get or anything like that, how can we even be prepared? Because that is when things can really, really go bad for me. I'm not telling you to be naive or to set yourself up for failure. All I'm saying is that there are things we can do to better manage our urge to catastrophize so that it doesn't end up ruining things for us. And my first way to do that is to check the facts. We often have thoughts about a situation or experience. Instead of checking those thoughts to ensure they're based in fact, we often just believe them right away. And remember, thoughts themselves they're not facts, they're just thoughts. And thinking a certain thought over and over and over doesn't make it true either. I want you to really think about that, pun intended. So be a detective, look for evidence to support that thought or possibly, and more helpfully, search for things to support a more positive outlook. And that can stop our urge to catastrophize. But what if that doesn't work? Uh, what if I have a lot of evidence to support my worry? I mean, I remember clearly that before I was shunned from my jerk of a friend group in high school, they were all whispering all the time. So if I see a friend of mine whispering with someone else and I'm not included in that whispering, that's all the evidence that I need to prove that they're going to leave me. So what I do is then I leave them first so that I don't get hurt. Okay, I know that that can feel like evidence, but when something like that happens, we have to communicate with the person that we saw whispering, for example. Tell them about our past and our current worry and see what they say. Only then can we have real evidence. Otherwise, we're just transferring our old experience onto this new one, you know? Okay, moving on. My next tip is to learn how to self-soothe. And I know this one may sound silly or possibly really hard to do, 
but it's such an important skill to learn. And all we have to do is to make a list of things that feel good to us. Use your five senses. Are there smells that you like or ones that ground you? Maybe there's a fuzzy pair of socks or comfy sweatpants you enjoy. This could also be achieved by paying attention to our breath and doing some four by four breathing, which is when you breathe in for four seconds, hold at the top for four seconds, and breathe out for four seconds. And you do that four times. And my final tip is to come up with a soothing mantra, like this thought or emotion will pass, or I'm here and I'm okay. Try this out, you know, whatever works for you. See, that's the thing, Katie, nothing works for me. I don't wanna be in my body. I have never felt calm and I hate breathing exercises. So thanks for nothing. I told you I had a reason to be upset and to worry about things. I still know everything is gonna go wrong. <sighs> okay, 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 I, I hear you. Each of these tips are different and some may work better for you than others. And since it seems like today is a particularly difficult time for you, I have to ask, have you taken care of your basic needs yet today? What does that mean? My basic needs. Well, basic needs are just that, basic. They are the things that we need to do in order to accomplish anything that's asked of us. Things like sleeping well, eating when we're hungry, and having supportive people in our lives. In DBT, we call this HALT. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Check in on those things before trying any other tools. Because if we haven't taken care of our basic needs first, we can't do the other things, or at least not do them as well. And that can make us more susceptible to those catastrophic thoughts. <sighs> so it looks like you're still with me, but if you are still struggling with urges to go down that negative catastrophic thought spiral, I have two more tricks up my sleeve. First, is to distract. Sometimes we don't feel well or we're super tired and just can't find the energy to fight the thoughts. And don't worry, that's okay. We can do something else for a bit until the urge to catastrophize passes. These must be healthy or at least benign things like going for a walk, talking to a friend, or watching your favorite show, playing your favorite video game. Whatever gets your mind off of the issue and gives the urge the time it needs to pass, because it will. And my goal for my patients is to keep them distracted for 30 minutes, then check back in on how they're feeling, and then try maybe another one of the tips or tools I offered. But isn't ignoring how we're feeling bad, isn't that like the opposite of therapy? I don't get this at all. That's actually a great question, and I'm really glad that you brought that up. <sighs> Distractions can sometimes feel like stuffing things down or ignoring, but they are in fact different. Distractions are a way to put something on the back burner, meaning I can't deal with this right now for whatever reason, so I'm gonna distract with something else, like a coping skill, work, game, etc., until I can deal with it later. That's the difference. Distracting is short term and ends with us actually working on the issue or expressing what's going on. Stuffing things down means we never come back to that issue or urge until it potentially erupts later. Oh, I guess that makes a little bit of sense. Good. Okay, my final tip is to see a professional. This could be a therapist, psychiatrist, or any other mental health professional. It's great to get some extra support and insight into why we are catastrophizing. Is it because of our anxiety? Maybe this urge comes from some trauma in our past. Seeing a professional can help us see our urge to catastrophize in a whole new light. And they can offer other tools and resources to help you better manage the urge until it goes away for good. 
Okay, I'm gonna have to stop you right there. I am not going to pay a stranger to listen to me talk about my problems. That's just creepy. And from what I've heard, they just try to push medication onto you, which I am not into. It's gonna be a hard pass. I know therapy can be odd and feel uncomfortable at first, but speaking with someone who is unfamiliar with you and your situation can be so helpful. That way they don't have any assumptions about us or know anything about our past unless we decide to tell them. That allows them to maybe see things we wouldn't and try out tools or techniques that we didn't even know existed. And as for medication, that may help some people, but if you aren't comfortable or interested in it, just say so. It's your body and your treatment. And besides, therapists can't prescribe medication anyways. Oh, I, I guess I can give that a try. I, I, I didn't realize that. Well, I hope some of you found that helpful. I know we can all get caught up in negative thought cycles, but there are so many things we can do to stop that from happening. And as always, do you have any other tips to share? Please leave what has helped you deal with that in the comments down below. And thanks again to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. Go to curiositystream.com forward slash Katie for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. Enter the promo code Katie when prompted during the sign up process and your membership is completely free for the first 30 days. Have a wonderful week and I will see you next time. Bye. My basic needs. my first foray into acting. <laughs> <laughs> so